Welcome this morning to August 16th, and our passage is Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. The title is, We Desperately Need a Spiritual Awakening. As I mentioned in the preview, we listened to a song entitled, What Wondrous Love Is This? that was written during the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening in American church history was just called the Great Awakening before our nation was founded. Christianity.com wrote this about that first awakening that took place about 1730. Many of the early Puritans and pilgrims arrived in America with a fervent faith and a vision for establishing a godly nation. Within a century, their enthusiasm had cooled. The children of those originals were more concerned with increasing wealth and comfortable living than furthering the kingdom of God. And that is what happens constantly in the lives of humanity. When we are more interested in our creature comforts than we are in the kingdom of God and the need for other people to know, inevitably, that causes stagnation in church. That same spiritual malaise is found then throughout the colonies just before the revolution. The most significant years of that first great awakening were 1740, 1742, but the revival continued into the 1760s. Many of those early colonists had come to the new world to enjoy religious freedom, but once they had become prosperous, they no longer relied on God for their daily bread. Wealth brought complacency. As a result, church membership dropped. Wishing to make it easier to increase church attendance, the religious leaders instituted what they called a halfway covenant, which is a term that describes making it a halfway commitment toward God that allowed membership without any public testimony at all of a conversion having taken place. The churches were now attended largely by people who lacked a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Sadly, many of the ministers themselves didn't know Christ and couldn't even lead those who listened to them into salvation. That is probably the greatest and worst charge that could be made against anyone who stands behind a pulpit with a Bible, that they don't know Christ and cannot lead someone into conversion, repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When that happens, it is no wonder that we have no spiritual life across our country. Suddenly then the Spirit of God awoke as though from an intense slumber they write and began to touch the people in the colonies, people from all walks of life. Poor farmers, rich merchants began experiencing renewal and rebirth. That first great awakening provided the spiritual foundation for our emerging nation. Those foundations have been seriously eroded. Anytime a church has to go before a court to ask for the court to give it permission to open, to attend worship services, we have fallen terribly far from our foundations. The United States Constitution having been signed, put into place, our very first amendment guaranteed that the government would not establish a religion, nor would the government interfere with the free exercise thereof. Along with that, the great freedoms of speech, of press, and the right to peaceably assemble to redress our government for grievances. But by the nation, have been founded within a decade, they needed another move of the Holy Spirit. Each generation needs a move of the Holy Spirit. That second great awakening brought the renewed knowledge of God's love for us as you heard in the song. And here are some of the words found in it. What wondrous love is this? O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul. What wondrous love of this is my, of my soul. The wondrous love that caused the Lord of bliss 
to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. And so to God and to the Lamb I will sing. I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And the last verse says this. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. When from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. While our nation and world sinks deeper into debt, deeper into despair, deeper into depression, deeper into discord and disharmony, I can only pray, and I hope that you and all the churches across America will pray that the darkness that envelops will only show in greater measure the great light and hope that's found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul writes to the Roman church from chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray and take a look at this passage. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. We pray for a, an awakening across our nation. I pray that this is the time when your spirit will begin to move in waves across your church, across our neighborhoods, our communities, our cities, to the bastions of power in Washington, D.C., to the financial empire in New York City. God, move, bring us to our knees. Use this darkness in contrast to the great light that's found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Paul says, we were helpless. Until you feel that you're helpless, you'll not look for a Savior. If you think you have all the answers in life, we'll never look toward heaven. But it's when we know that we have no more hope, no more help, no more answers for what's facing us, then we turn to God. We're helpless. You wouldn't think so with the political races heating up. The accusations one against another and the claims that this person or that political party or this ideology has the answer. They will tell you that they are the ones that have the hope for tomorrow. And if it is void of the gospel, then they are helpless. Only God is the helper for our nation. Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watch the city, the watchman watches in vain. But there's another group, one that's trying to offer help using the things that this world offers, and then another group that is bent on destruction. This group's hatred for all that is good is demonstrated by an unwillingness to be satisfied until everything is burned to the ground, torn up, shredded. And what they want is a new beginning based on what appears to be nothing more than anarchy. Who would die for a righteous man, Paul asks. The question is, who could find one? The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. Would you dare to die for a neighbor of yours? Maybe for a family member is what Paul is saying. 
But what about for an enemy? What about for someone who's burning down a city? Would you die for a man like that? Yet God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What wondrous love of this. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, that the Lord of bliss would leave heaven above and die for my sins. I see few people willing to die for the good of others any longer. It used to be that built into the foundation, into the fabric of our country, was a willingness to give of ourselves for the good of those around and for the good of the future of our children. That's gone. Now it's about me. And no more sense that what I am doing today either destroys tomorrow or builds tomorrow. Senseless acts of violence fill every night now and day. A five-year-old boy riding his bike shot to death by a neighbor. Our largest cities are doubling their murder statistics from last year. There are far left and far right groups encouraging and committing violence. Social media is now used to initiate an all out assault on businesses as cars and trucks with trailers in tow drive through glass doors and windows, smashing their way in and then filling those trailers and heading out as stores are looted. High end stores. This is not a need for bread. Into the violent world ruled by Rome, we hear the news from the letter to the Romans that only one, Jesus Christ, would be willing to die for the people of a nation like ours. Not just for the good, not just for the righteous, but for the sinners. And that is every one of us. And until we all realize that, that we are helpless, that we are lost, that we are under God's wrath without a savior, then we will never turn to him. And if we don't, then there is no hope for our nation or for our world. We have been, in spite of our flaws and failures, we have been a, a place that the gospel has gone forth from around the world at one time our country sent more missionaries and more dollars than any other country. The last statistic I heard is that we are the third highest country receiving missionaries into our country. There are reasons for that. One of them are all the different nationalities that are coming and those that are raised in those other nations and understand the culture and the language. They are steps ahead of the rest of us to reach the lost. And so that I applaud. But the fact that we are not sending out like we used to bothers me. God's love is not for the deserving, but for the undeserving. That's love, not just for a neighbor, but love for an enemy. And this is the only news that can stop the destruction and the hatred that fills our streets and our hearts. Our nation needs a spiritual awakening. We need to do more than just put new people into positions of political power. We need people who are empowered by Christ's love, who are empowered by the principles of God's kingdom, who have those principles deeply imprinted on their hearts and their souls, who live them out day to day, who care about others as Christ cared. We need people who believe more in the power of prayer than in the power of the ballot box or the mailbox. We need to do more than stand during our presentation of our nation's flag. We need to stand for righteousness. We need to stand for reconciliation between God and every human being. 
We need to stand for reconciliation between one race and another race, between one nation and another nation, between one people and another people. We need to stand up to those who are bent on destroying everything around them and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and demonstrate God's love in how we treat everyone around us. In spite of the frustrations that we experience as we see what's happening around us, God's love has not been diminished it still endures forever the last time I read the good book. Thank God. I cannot imagine how anarchy offers anything but night after night of destruction. I have not seen them build anything yet. In contrast, the gospel offers hope. It offers the presence of Christ in building God builds broken lives. God redeems lost lives. God takes that which is shattered and appears completely useless and shapes, recreates. Thank God that we are his workmanship created brand new in Christ Jesus for good works which God has appointed beforehand that we should walk in. The news that the church has is the best news that America could ever have printed in its newspapers, its books, on the internet, and all the cable news programs. An awakening is needed. And I'm of the firm belief that is the only hope that is left for America. We're facing an election in just several months. I'm not hopeful that whichever candidate is elected will have the answer. No matter who is put in office, they will be opposed. Billy Graham's last message to the American people was titled this way, our country's in great need of spiritual awakening. When you look through our history, there were only a few short periods of time in which there was not someone sent from God to awaken us. This last generation has seen one of the world's great evangelists go on to meet his savior and his beloved wife. And what we need is another young man, young woman, group of young men and young women to take that same message that Billy Graham preached for 70 years. God loves us, we're sinners standing condemned but Christ died for our sins. So again, Paul says, while we were still helpless at the right time, and now is as right a time as any for America to hear, Christ died for the ungodly. It takes a recognition, an honest look inside the soul to say that I'm one of those lost I'm one of the sinners. I'm one of the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There is hope, but only with an awakening. I hope that you'll pray during this coming week, every morning, as you spend time with the Lord, Say, God, please bring an awakening. May your Holy Spirit touch our hearts across the nation and help us before it's too late. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Christ to be the Savior of all humanity. Every nation, 
every race, every language, every economic group, from those that rule to those who are the ruled, everyone is in need of a savior. Father, we pray for an awakening across our country. You did that for us before we were founded as a nation. You did that shortly after we were founded. We're grateful for the ministry of those like Billy Graham who have gone before us, but God, we need a new generation being awoken so that the gospel may make an impact on our country. May it be so, we pray today in Jesus' name, amen.